welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. In January of 1940, MLJ Comics launched an anthology called Pep Comics. It featured some superheroes that have been rebooted several times throughout the years and are fairly famous characters like The Shield and The Comet. It also featured some characters that are long since forgotten, like Fu Chang, International Detective. Today, we're going to talk about one of those characters that did not stand the test of time. A character who did not fight war criminals, per se. He did not go up against gangsters to protect the public. He went up against enemies specifically to protect his father's newspaper. We're going to talk about the Press Guardian. And before we go too far, let me just tell you, stay tuned till the very end of this episode. I have some really big news. Without any further ado, let's talk about the Press Guardian. Issue 1 of Pep Comics featured some important characters in a historical sense. The Shield was the first patriotic hero, debuting a full year ahead of Captain America. The Comet was created by Jack Cole, best known for creating Plastic Man, and was the first superhero to die in a story taking place in issue 17. But we're here to look at The Press Guardian, created by Jack Binder and Mort Meskin. Binder was the co-creator of the original Daredevil, and his younger brother Otto was famous for co-creating Supergirl and writing many fun Captain and Marvel stories. Mort Meskin uh, was also there. The Press Guardian appears in the first 11 issues of Pep Comics and then suddenly disappeared. His introduction was also confusing. Issue 1 has a splash panel to introduce us to the Press Guardian. There he is in the lower left corner of the panel. And to the right, we seem to have an important reporter who is known as Flash Calvert. Let's see what these two guys have to do with each other as we move forward. We're told that the Press Guardian, otherwise known as the Falcon, aids the Daily Express in its efforts to rid the city of gangsters. Who needs one superhero name when you can have two? He's not just the Press Guardian, he's the Falcon. Not that Falcon. This guy came first. A Daily Express editor calls in one of their reporters, that's Flash Calvert, and tells him that he's got a tip on some gangsters, tells him to get over and get a story so that they can have an extra edition printed really fast. Flash Calvert runs right past some cops onto an active crime scene. At least one of the cops is doing their job saying, hey, you can't go in there. But the other cop says, let him go. He's Flash Calvert, the reporter. I love that second police officer. He doesn't really care about stuff like forensic evidence getting tampered with. He's like, hey, 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 don't worry about it. This guy's a reporter. He can do whatever he wants. Flash could have talked to the police officers to find out what went on, but he actually goes to a man who was robbed and says, What happened? Give me the dope, mister. Four masked men robbed and shot me. Left no clues. And the man does seem to have a bloody finger. But in the next panel, Flash says, No clues, eh? I've seen this lighter before in the hands of Slug Wickham. And sure enough, he has a lighter with the initials SW on it. What exactly were these cops even there for? They're not stopping anyone from entering an active crime scene. They have not helped a man who has been shot. That's pretty bad. And they also missed a big obvious clue. I guess that one's debatable, but we'll call it a clue. These are some of the worst police ever. And that's saying something. Flash Calvert is really proud of this clue that he found. He's pointing directly to it and saying, I never saw another one like it. Slug dropped it. He's guilty. Suddenly, one of the cops wakes up and says, Hey, I'll take that. Here it is, officer. At least you have some evidence. You never saw a lighter with two letters engraved on it. Yeah, this is an open and shut case. Clearly, no one else could engrave a lighter. Flash gets to a payphone, hey, this is 1940, and calls in the tip, and in the next panel it says, within 10 minutes, an extra appears on the street. Headlines scream the story of Slug Wickham's complicity in the case. 10 minutes! I don't think an online newspaper can get an article up within 10 minutes, but this one had to be written, proofread, typeset, printed, and distributed. 10 minutes! Maybe this is a very small city. 
Apparently things happen very fast because by the time Flash gets back to the office, his editor is saying, Slug Wickham just showed me his cigar lighter. He didn't lose it, you lughead. You're fired. Mort Meskin gives us a fantastic introduction to this character. We get to see the back of his head as Slug Wickham says, Here it is. Been in my pocket all the time. But it's just like the one I found. I have a crazy theory. I'm going to share it with you guys. I think it's possible. It's possible. And I know this is basically sci-fi level territory. I think it's possible that Slug Wickham had two cigar lighters. It's just a theory. It's just a theory. I know it's crazy. Let's see if it pans out. The gangster throws a punch at Flash and Flash, I guess, punches Slug back? I'm not sure Mort Meskin has ever seen how a punch is delivered. In fighting, there's really only so many punches that you could do. You've got a jab, you've got a cross, you've got a hook, you've got an uppercut. Uh, but Flash invents something new, which I guess is just called the slide. He just sort of slides his fist across, sort of near Slug Wickham's face. Seems to be effective. Slug Wickham just decides to walk away in pain, and Flash asks his editor to give me another chance, Chief, and I'll clear this mess up by midnight. Okay, but it's your last chance. Guess he's not fired. Flash puts his detective skills to use by going to Slug Wickham's warehouse and watching him through the window. Inside, Slug Wickham is dealing with his gangsters and he just outlines his plan. I fixed our alibi at the paper. They're glad I'm not suing. Now to divvy the swag. But instantly, one of the gangsters notices that there's a man standing by the window right next to them, just watching them. Flash Calvert is good at finding clues. He does not seem to be great at being a detective overall, though. I mean, he's basically standing right outside of a window that's shown to be just feet away from the bad guys. Of course, they see him instantly. Now, I know what you're thinking. When is Flash going to put on his superhero suit? Well, just wait, because this story is about to go in some pretty nutty directions. The next panel reads, in a surprise move, the gangsters grab Flash and drag him into the room. Sorry to keep interrupting, but we're told that that was a surprise move. Grabbing Flash was a surprise move? What was the unsurprise move? To just awkwardly pretend that they didn't notice him? Uh, yeah, so, um, I guess we'll just divvy up this money that we stole. I, I, I guess nobody's watching us. I certainly don't see anybody. Now that he's held at gunpoint, Flash tells Slug, and now I'm sure that you and your mob held up the Klondike Cafe. Slug admits it, and then in the next page, we get to see a superhero. It says, while Slug is talking, a sinister figure lurks in the shadows of the gang's den. It is the Falcon, the guardian of the press. And just look at this jerk. So there's the twist. Flash Calvert is not really the protagonist, even though he's the guy that we've been following so far in this story, because he is definitely not Falcon slash Press Guardian. And I mean, just look at this weirdo. We're told that a sinister figure was lurking in the shadows, but look at all of those colors. That thing is so garish. I don't know how he would have possibly blended into the shadows. He was probably shining brighter than a neon light. The Falcon does not take orders, he gives them! And then this Falcon guy just beats up the gangsters. There's several panels of him beating people up, smashing heads together, throwing punches. He saves Flash from getting shot. And then, Falcon slash Press Guardian holds Slug Wickham at gunpoint, twists his arm, and says, You're gonna write out a full confession. Yes, yes, I'll do it! The gangster chief, thoroughly whipped, begs for mercy. The Falcon tells him that only by signing a full confession can he hope to get mercy from the press guardian. Slug, shaking from fear, writes out his confession. I'm no lawyer, but I'm pretty sure that a confession made under duress is not admissible in a court of law. But I tell you what, I actually know a lawyer. My friend, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 on YouTube, he has a YouTube channel. He's also a lawyer. So I'll ask him, Hoodie Coco, would this be legal to get a confession signed this way? 
No, of course not. Makes sense. Let's continue. After that, the Falcon and Flash call a bunch of reporters over. Flash asks the Falcon, thanks for everything, but tell me, who are you? Keep in mind, we were told in the second panel that the Falcon is well known for helping out the newspaper against gangsters. But Flash doesn't seem to know who he is, so maybe Flash isn't very good at his job at the newspaper. Just call me the Falcon. I'm not disclosing my real name until this city is free of crime. And so no one ever learned his name. Now I know you're figuring, well, the story's over, right? Flash has been saved, the Falcon tied up all the gangsters, he's left, it's over, right? Uh, no, it keeps going. Flash calls in the story to his newspaper, then all of a sudden Slug Wickham gets free, so does some of his gangsters, but this time Flash just knocks them out and the police arrive. The story is released to the press and the newspaper editor congratulates Flash on a job well done. Pretty weird story with the superhero having two code names, both the Falcon and the Press Guardian. I don't know what a bird of prey really has to do with newspapers, but I hope you didn't get too attached to Flash Calvert because now we go into the second issue and Flash is gone forever. He has no more stories about the Press Guardian. In the big splash page, we're told about the Moronia Bund threatening an editor of the newspaper. And that is, by the way, the press guardian there in the corner. I know he looks absolutely nothing like he did last time, but he is supposed to be the same character. Now he basically just dresses up like the spirit and carries around a gun like the shadow. Quick note on what a Bund was. This was 1940. America had not picked a side in World War II, and Bunds were Nazi sympathizers here in America. Not awesome. Fortunately, they are portrayed as the villains, so that aged okay. In the last issue, we were told that the Press Guardian would never reveal his name, but that isn't true for us, the reader, because here we get told exactly who he is. Perry Chase, playboy son of the publisher of the Daily Express, begs for a chance to work on the Moronia Bund case. They'll think I'm so stupid that no one will suspect me. This is a man's job. You stick to society reporting. Get used to this. Perry Chase is treated like crap by the newspaper, and I guess he figures that's an effective disguise. Hey, Dad, can I report on something serious? No, you're way too stupid. <laughs> If I'm so stupid, why do I dress up in a green suit and fight crime in a mask? Perry picks up his mask and says, a man's job is it, I'll show them. And then he instantly does not put on the mask and instead gets a job at the Bund working as a janitor so that he can listen in and spy on them. The Bund expresses that they're nervous about the newspaper, but that they're not going to make a move until their boss tells them to. In the next panel, Perry witnesses one of the Bund members named Von Leo running, so he decides to tag along. Somehow, Perry has time to throw on his costume, and he jumps on the back of Von Leo's car. Somehow, Von Leo does not see the press guardian, so either Von Leo is very stupid, or the press guardian is very lucky. Von Leo grabs a bomb. It's that little thing that looks like an apple. I guess Mort Meskin has never seen an actual bomb, but that's okay. We're told that it's a bomb, and the press guardian dramatically makes his entrance, only to get shot right in the chest. However, nothing happens, and the press guardian says, you'll have to get better ammunition than that to kill the press guardian. I've read all 11 stories, and we're never told that the press guardian has a bulletproof vest, or any specific gear other than a gun, uh, so maybe he's bulletproof. I really don't know what to tell you. He's either bulletproof or he wears a bulletproof vest. Either way, we're not told. All we know for sure is that he got shot right in the chest, made no move to duck, and he's fine. Since a bullet didn't stop him, Von Leo then pistol whips Press Guardian. Press Guardian tosses the bomb out the window, and then he fights Von Leo, knocking him out the window, and I don't know if Press Guardian is supposed to be super strong. It looks like Von Leo is launched out of this window about 20 feet. Who knows? All I can say is, it looks cool. Not as cool? Press Guardian's catchphrase, where he says, Here goes a dish of scrambled eggs. 
Here goes a dish of scrambled eggs. Well, sure, I tried to look it up. I couldn't find that that was ever a phrase. I guess that's just something the press guardian likes to say. Hey, Dad, help me think up quips in case I ever get in a fight. No, I'm too busy, and that's stupid. Cheese and crackers. Tabletop scraps. My silverware fell down. I need more buttons on this jacket. How are those? Later, Perry begs for his father to let him be put on a real reporting case. And instead, his father just browbeats him some more and says, you didn't have sense enough to learn the identity of the press guardian when he was right here in the building last night. Yeah, he was right there in the building. You could have just asked him his name. Oh wait, Flash tried that, it didn't work. I don't understand the logic here, but somehow the Bund figures that there must be a traitor in their midst spying on them. They open a door, and unfortunately for Perry, he's standing right there with his broom, and so they shoot at him, but he runs away through a ventilation duct. Perry gets away, puts on his press guardian outfit, then decides to call the police. That works. And then he gets picked up by an airplane and leaves, saying, Good old Baldwin. I knew he'd get here in time. Who the hell is Baldwin? Well, to know that, you just have to read the caption box. You don't actually get to meet him, ever. Perry's valet, the only man who knows that Perry is the press guardian, has arrived in time to prevent Perry from having to reveal his true identity once more as the press guardian. The rest of these stories more or less follow a pattern where Perry either overhears at the newspaper some sort of big case, or, more often, the newspaper is threatened and he protects the newspaper as the press guardian. This is a very specific job for a superhero. He doesn't just protect all of the press, he protects his father's newspaper specifically. This would sort of be like if Blue Beetle was introduced and he went around protecting one beetle. Unlike a lot of other Golden Age stories, even though each six-page story of the Press Guardian does complete a story, there's also a bit of a continuity. For instance, issue three starts with Von Leo climbing out of the river. He's fine. So there's a continuing threat. And what he decides to do is kidnap the daughter of the man who holds the mortgage on the newspaper building. That's a little convoluted, but I guess it gets the newspaper involved again. Von Leo calls the mortgage broker and says, Foreclose the mortgage on the Daily Express at once if you wish to see your daughter alive again. If you don't believe we will carry out our plan, look out the window at your office building. And then he actually blows up an entire building. The mortgage holder is stunned, saying, The fiends! Killing hundreds of people! Those are some pretty big stakes. Up until now, people have been shot at. In fact, one store owner got shot, but he was fine. Now all of a sudden, hundreds of people are dead, but we're just told it in one quick little panel and it just breezes right past all that violence. The Golden Age. The press guardian starts snooping around trying to find the kidnapped daughter. Then this really weird gangster shoots at him. He seems to have an arm coming right out of his shoulder. That is some fantastic art by Mort Meskin. Love it. The press guardian climbs into a building where the Bund is holding this girl hostage. He knocks out Von Leo and unties her, then decides to swap clothes and says, I may be able to get you out of here. Guard. The press guardian is unconscious. I shall take this girl to the leaders. As you say, sir. But then in the next panel, the guy all of a sudden realizes that this does not look anything like his boss, and he shouts out, The spy! It's the press guardian! Sound the alarm! Good guess on it being the press guardian, since the press guardian wears a mask, but yeah, he is right. That said, the press guardian basically just beats up all the bad guys and gets the girl home to her father. And then for two straight pages, the press guardian just beats the hell out of the remaining Bund members. The end. Issue four starts calling Perry Chase literal names. Uh, for instance, here it says, even the publisher of the Daily Express doesn't know that his effet son, Perry Chase, secretly is the dauntless press guardian. A future issue calls him sissified. 
And the beginning of this story talks about how dumb everybody thinks Perry is when he says, Send me to the Capitol, Dad. I'd like to uncover the one man our documents didn't name, the top man. It might be a good idea. Perry is so simple, the crooks would ignore him. Effet, sissified, simple, the people at Perry's job just do not respect him. However, he does soon get a partner. Perry enters his new office at the Capitol. Cynthia Blake, what are you doing here? This is a dangerous job I'm on. I'm to be your assistant. Your father gave me the job. Yeah, the lady that he rescued last week ends up being his secretary. She does find out that he's the press guardian, and honestly, Cynthia Blake is awesome. She doesn't call him names or anything. She gets right in on the action in every single story. She hides in the back of Perry's car so that she can go along on adventures. Cynthia gets in on the action, knocking criminals out when there's big fight scenes. She even sneaks around and pulls a gun on criminals, shooting at them. She's great. You get the idea of these stories. I just want to point out a few highlights from some of the other issues. In issue 6, a man named Abner Sundell took over the writing duties. He was an early writer and editor at MLJ that hired Victor Bloom to write the first three appearances of Archie Andrews in Pep Comics. Yes, MLJ Comics eventually became Archie Comics. In the sixth issue, Cynthia Blake and the Press Guardian go to interview a reclusive diplomat. Turns out that a bad guy has kidnapped him and has taken his place. There's one fun little trivia bit here where the Press Guardian has to climb a building and he says, Here's where I give the wizard competition. The wizard was another MLJ superhero. They had a bunch, but the Press Guardian never actually teamed up with any of them, even though they would go on to form a superhero team called the Mighty Crusaders. Issue 7 finally gives the Press Guardian a recurring arch nemesis. Now, who would be a good opposite for the Press Guardian? I would say that maybe somebody like uh, a corrupt diplomat or a corrupt senator, because they're in a position of power, uh, and they don't respect the position of power that the press has. Or maybe you could go with somebody that's an actual criminal, like a huge mob boss, somebody like the Kingpin. Or maybe you could even introduce somebody that has superpowers. Now that would be a threat, physically, for somebody like the Press Guardian that just goes around with a gun and, and his fists, you know? So, uh, instead, uh, they went with an old man an old disabled man. Issue 6 had ended on a cliffhanger, an actual to-be-continued, where the villain had left a bunch of gunpowder and explosives, but Issue 7 quickly ends that threat by the Press Guardian stepping on the fuse to put it out. Later he meets the genius in charge of everything, and here he is. This man is called The Claw. Yes, he's an old man with a really big head, a thin wisp of hair, he's definitely balding, he smokes, he's got a monocle, and we later see that he's even missing a hand, he has a claw there, hence his brilliant code name. The claw continues to show up in issue 8, where he kidnaps Cynthia briefly. He shows up again in issue 9, where this time he's actually created some sort of sci-fi monster men. That's a big twist, but the Press Guardian is able to get an antidote and turn the men back to normal by the end of the issue. Issue 10 has the claw yet again, and this time he's got some sort of a monster henchman. That said, it apparently isn't that hard to take him out. Cynthia takes him out with one kick while she's tied up. The final issue does not use the claw. Instead, we start with Cynthia and Perry looking at the newspaper, and Perry says, So the government is requiring all aliens to register. Good idea. Uh, don't get too excited. I know we got monsters. We're not talking outer space aliens. He's just talking about how we started giving out IDs, green cards, to aliens who had moved to the United States. The final issue deals with just some thugs, who are trying to extort a French gentleman, and he's afraid because he believes he's here illegally. So he's been paying them. That said, the press guardian figures everything out. He jumps in, beats some people up. The French gentleman explains that he's nervous about talking to the police because he thinks that he's going to be deported. 
but he decides to do the right thing and report the gentleman, and the press guardian says, Peter, you came into this country before the World War, didn't you? Oui, monsieur, in 1913, but why? When you volunteered to fight for your country, you took the oath of allegiance, and that automatically made you a citizen. That means you can't be deported. And the next panel says that the press guardian will be back in the next issue of Pep Comics, but he sure as hell wasn't. Now, the shield and the comet, they continued for a while, but 11 six-page stories was all we got of the press guardian, a.k.a. the Falcon. The MLJ superheroes, headlined by the shield, lost their popularity in the 40s, and Archie took over the main spot of Pep Comics. The company eventually rebranded themselves as Archie Comics. They tried to bring the shield back briefly in 1959 under the Archie Adventure series with some other superheroes, and even had superstars Jack Kirby and Joe Simon working on The Shield and The Fly, among others. Archie gave a shot at teaming the characters up in 1965's Mighty Crusaders as part of its new Red Circle imprint. It didn't last long. Archie tried again in 1983 with Rich Buckler as writer and editor, but it only lasted 13 issues. DC Comics then licensed the heroes in 1992, for eight issues. None of these teams included the Press Guardian. In 2012, Archie relaunched the characters as the new Crusaders for six digital issues. Finally, Archie rebranded its superhero line as Dark Circle Comics and put out another four issues of The Shield in 2015. Characters like The Shield and the Comet kept coming back, but I think we all know what the people would really want, what they would really respond to, Cynthia Blake returning as the Press Guardian. Yes, I think the time is right. Folks, thank you so much for taking a look at this very fun and weird superhero from the Golden Age. He sure had a specific mission. And I told you, I had some news. Keep your eye out on this site as well as my social media accounts. I'm doing a cover for Dynamite Comics. I'm doing a Vampirella cover. Very excited to announce it. That campaign is launching imminently. So keep your eye out, like I say, on social media and on this channel, as well as my other channel. That's right, on Monday afternoons, I always do a two hour live stream recapping the comic books and the comic book news of the week. Very fun live show. I'll be mentioning it and plugging it there, but I had to plug myself here too. I think it's really fun. I really sincerely think you guys are going to like it, and I hope you'll consider supporting me by picking that up. It will be an Indiegogo campaign so that we know exactly how many people want to get that cover and how to get it right to them ASAP. Keep your eye out. Thank you so much for following me. I'll be back next week with another exciting episode of Comic Tropes, and until then, keep reading comics. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks. It featured a lot of superheroes that have been rebooted and are seriously... Didn't get it. You know, a lot of the times, <laughs> he kind of just stood right... <laughs> what would the default have been for the gangsters to just awkwardly ignore <laughs> Let's just keep doing our business, guys. Um, I don't see anything out of the ordinary. Kitty, you meowed. He slay... He slaves? So, I gotta ask, Hoodie Coco, is it... <laughs> <laughs> That's too silly. It's too silly. Cat's getting in trouble. Yeah, there we go. Okay. I would argue it does not really... <laughs> the wither... The wither. Almost got it. Wizard. The wizard was actually another MLJ superhero, so it's... Ugh. Stuttering. In issue seven... What's his name? The Press Guardian. You could go with, say, a... Mo uh.